This session is entitled Multilingualism Invented. We have three distinguished speakers, three presentations of 25 minutes. Uh, after those, the presenters will have the opportunities to comment and ask each other uh, questions before we open up the discussion to the public. It's a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Thomas Paul Bonfilio. He is uh, William Judson's, uh, Judson Gaines Professor of Comparative Literature and Linguistics at the University of Richmond. Uh, and the title of his presentation is The Invention of the Native Speaker. Uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, again, repeated, repeated thanks to uh, Chantel and David for organizing this fabulous um, fabulous symposium. And uh, bonjour, chérie. And also, um, thank you as well for giving me 15 hours difference from uh, Claire Kramsch, uh, an act impossible to follow. And I appreciate the, uh, uh, the time. On Thursday, July 12, 1990, the Singapore newspaper, The Straits Times, listed the following advertisement. Established private school urgently requires native-speaking expatriate English teachers for foreign students. By Saturday, July 14th, the advertisement had been changed to read, Established private school urgently requires native-speaking Caucasian teachers for foreign students. It does not require great powers of speculation to imagine the discussions at the Straits Times on that Friday the 13th, an inauspicious day for the Anglophone applicants who didn't look like they spoke English properly. This example belies the ostensible innocence and neutrality of the locution native speaker, which is used to indicate someone possessing natural authority and language. It shows that the semantic field of the term native clearly contains notions of race and ethnicity. The ethnic ownership of language is supported by the divisive image of the authority of the native speaker, an authority that is configured as an infallible birthright, an innate sense of the acceptable utterance. Recent research, however, beginning with Thomas Pike Day's The Native Speaker is Dead, 1985, has illuminated the prejudicial gestures of power and hegemony in the image of the native speaker. Although scholarship has succeeded in problematizing the issue, the, con the concept of native speaker itself has never been historicized. My work historicized the historicizes the metaphors of nativity and maternality found in the locutions native speaker, mother tongue, langue maternelle, locuteur natif, motorsprache, lingua materna, motorsprache, and so on, and illuminates the ethno-linguistic prejudices that generate the apparently innocent kinship metaphors employed to describe the authority of the L1 speaker. Okay? The object of criticism is native speaker. The neutral term is L1, okay? Because it gets rid of notions of nativity. These locutions arose with the nation states. They didn't exist before. In the early modern era, as gestures of ethno-linguistic nationalism, in its prejudicial form, our native language, our mother tongue, which is our birthright, is seen as endangered by the presence of an other, who is perceived as a biological contaminant and thus a threat to the matrix of nation, ethnicity, and language. The genetic myths of mother tongue and native language, especially in the service of exclusionary nationalism, were not present in antiquity. Those metaphors were not there. While the Romans and Greeks had clear standards of proper Roman Latin and Attic Greek, they did not articulate these standards in ethnic contexts. The Greek term for proper speech was glossa attike, which we see up there, at attic speech, which denoted speaking within the established tradition. Although language purism was widespread among the Greeks, there was no evidence that the performance of glossa attike was connected to ethnicity or nativity. The collective, identity of, uh, the collective identity of the Greek elite tended to be articulated through culture and language rather than race. The Roman discourse of language also had little in common with the current Western notions of native speaker and mother tongue. 
The Roman term for proper speech was sermo patrios. This locution is regularly mistranslated as native language, although those roots are not there, in spite of the absence of images of nativity in the original Latin. The term sermo refers to discourse in general, and patrios indicates speaking in the proper tradition of the forefathers. The massive digital library, Persius, offers no examples of sermo in combination with derivatives of mater or natus. It's not present in antiquity. Ancient Greece and Rome were by no means exempt from racism, but ideologies of race and ethnicity were not present in the discursive language at that time. One can apply some of the theories of Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. Could we go down a bit? Yeah. Uh, to the historicization of the native speaker, the hegemony of Latin in the Roman Empire had made that language the monolithic medium of law, education, and culture in general. The same was true of the Latin Middle Ages. From the Roman Empire, Christianity inherited in toto a massive in infrastructural network and administrative monopoly that only needed rededication in religious terms. All texts of the church were produced in Latin, which was the language of instruction for all university students as well. All were second language learners, all were L2 learners, and none could claim native language property rights. Hans Kohn holds that in the Middle Ages, people looked upon everything as not from the point of view of their nationality or race, but from the point of view of religion. Mankind was divided not into Germans and French and Slavs and Italians, but into Christians and infidels and within Christianity into the faithful sons of the church and heretics. The nascence of the mother tongue was to await the secular catalytic influences of the early modern period, the birth of the nation states, and the need to justify writing in the national vernaculars, Italian, French, German, Spanish, etc., instead of in Latin. In 1304, Dante Alighieri wrote De Vulgari Eloquentia, in which he characterized the difference between the vernacular and Italian as such. I declare that vernacular language is that which we learn without any formal instruction by imitating our wet nurses, nutricem. There also exists another kind of language which the Romans called grammatica. Few, however, achieve complete fluency in it. Of these two kinds of language, the more noble is the vernacular because it was the language originally used by humans and because it is natural to us, while, while the other is, in contrast, artificial. Dante thus situates the Italian vernacular as natural and Latin as artificial. The notion of a maternal connection is implicit in the word nutrix, which in the plural also stands as a trope for the breasts. Okay? Dante muses over the origin of language and is confronted with a problem. If we learn the first language from our wet nurses, from whom did Adam learn his first language? Since he must have been a man without mother or milk. Vir sine matre, vir sine lacte. Here, the figures of the mother and of maternality become explicit. In the next paragraph, Dante uses for the first time the phrase mother tongue, maternam locutionem. The observations of Dante on the superiority of Italian vis-a-vis -vis Latin are indicative of a Copernican revolution in the configuration and representation of language. The understanding of language in terms of metaphors of nativity and maternality was to become the dominant linguistic episteme thereafter. It persists to the present day, not only in popular, but also in academic discourse. Uh, can we drop down a bit? Yeah. Man without mother. Yes, please. Let's see if we can get this. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Sorry. Uh, can we go back up a bit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Right there. Thank you. You can stand. I'll stand. You don't have to. Okay, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> The observations of Dante on the superior, whoop, 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 I just said that, yes, okay. The Italian Renaissance scholar Pietro Bembo, who authored Le Prose della Volga Lingua, said that we drink the vernacular with the milk of our wet nurses, latte dalle nutrici. Uh, the question remains, 
How do we explain the shift from Sermo Patrius to Lingua Materna? The sudden appearance of maternal images in the discourse of language in the late Middle Ages is not at all gratuitous or coincidental. It arose from the larger cultural, religious, and political milieu of the time. It is important to remember that the intellectual discourse of the European Middle Ages was largely produced and consumed by ecclesiastics. The most important figure in medieval Catholicism was clearly Jesus. Also of great importance was the figure of Mary, the mother of God, who functioned as a mediatrix and to whom one directed prayers. Mary's role was to intercede in the presence of her son on behalf of the petitioner. The maternality of Mary was a pivotal image in medieval painting and sculpture. She is often represented nursing the baby Jesus, which served to sanctify the acts of lactation and nursing themselves. Interestingly, the maternal corporeality of Mary also acted in combination with that of Jesus himself as he who provided his body and blood in the rite of the Eucharist. The two corporeal images functioned in symbiosis. The medieval scholar Carolyn Bynum has written extensively on the figure of Mary in the Middle Ages. Bynum observes that women's bodies in the acts of lactation and giving birth were analogous to both ordinary food and the body of Christ as it died on the cross and gave birth to salvation. She adds, through lactation, woman is the essential food provider and preparer. Bynum holds that the cult of the virgin's milk was one of the most extensive in late medieval Europe. It was so powerful that it became extended to Jesus and the church as well. This cult generated some odd permutations, among which are found depictions of a lactating Jesus. And let's see how we're doing here. Um, good. The first image is by uh, Corizia da Morano, Redentore che comunica una monica. And this is from the Galleria dell'Accademica Venezia. We can see what has happened here. Now, that was the wound in Christ's side, right? You push it up to the breast. He's dispensing communion. Right? The, the, the image of the Virgin in the Middle Ages was so powerful that it engendered a regendering of the, figuring of, of the figure of Jesus. Okay. Could I have the next image, please? I'm sorry, next picture, yes. I've never felt, I've never had this much power before, you know. Fiat pictura, poesis. Um, the second image, uh, which is uh, Christus und Caritas from the Rheinisches Bildarchiv in Köln, uh, also shows the same image uh, where the breast is, Jesus is dispensing his sanctifying blood into a chalice. The next image, please. Uh, this one is quite interesting. It's uh, Konrad Witz. Christus und der ungläubige Thomas um, und Christus und Maria fürbitten vor Gott Vater. And this is from Basel. And we can see here that uh, what Mary is doing is she's praying for those poor little kids there. And she's displaying her breast. Jesus is pointing to his wound breast. And there's uh, the nice blonde God, the Father, uh, listening to them. And then Thomas is over on the side, side, sticking his finger into the wounds of Christ. A next image, please. All right. um, this is from the, um, <clears throat> the Polpito del Duomo de Pisa by Giovanni Pisano. And it's uh, something that's called Ecclesia Lactans, the Lactating Church. Okay? We can see that this uh, bigendered figure is, is basically. Um, uh, neutrifying, if you will, uh, the, the parishioners. And the next image, please. Uh, this is wonderful. This is from the, um, the Domplatz in Nuremberg. It's Der Tugendbrunnen, the Fountain of Virtues. And there's a statue, uh, allegorical statue, of each virtue dispensing water from uh, the breasts. Let's have a, the next picture, which is a close-up. And we can see that. Uh, the, the, the virtues are literally coming out of their breasts. Right? And a wonderful picture. Imagine these little kids standing there lapping up the water. Right, we'll hold on to that. Um, now, when I discovered this, of course, I, 
I, would I engage my own cultural heritage? And the first thing I said was, Marona mia. Huh? That was my reaction. Okay? I wasn't the first. I found out that Leo Spitza, the wonderful comparatist Leo Spitza, had said the same thing in 1948 in an article that just got lost in the absence of a sociolinguistic culture studies in 1948. It was a good 40, 50 years ahead of its time. In the article, Muttersprache und Muttererziehung. Okay, something else is going on as well. One of the most influential images in the generation of ethno-linguistic prejudice is that of the Tower of Babel, which serves as a conventional point of reference for claims of linguistic primordiality and sanctity. There were only three known representations of the tower before the end of the 11th century, but there are 140 representations between 1550 and the early 17th century, an appearance that correlates with the anxieties of the emerging nation state. Could I have the next image, please? We have two types of images of the Tower of Babel. This is a very, not a very common one, one that goes straight up, okay? Why not? Well, number one, it's architecturally unsound because it's going to fall over, right? But there's another reason. Please advance. This is, they're, they're, these are much more common, okay? And this is, um, could I have the, yeah, can you scroll down a bit? I'm sorry, yeah, the first one, I forgot to give you the, um, uh, just go back, we need to go back up again. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, this is the, the, the Babelturm. Uh, that was the narrow one by the Meister der Weltenkonig. Isn't that a wonderful name? Wouldn't you? I'd love to be called Meister der Weltenkonig. Uh, the second one is Lukas von Feichenborg, Toren von Babel. And this is a much more common image. Now let's think about this. What you have are a whole bunch of entrances at the bottom, All right. the polyphonic entrances that become less and less as one approaches an original language. So this is a fantasy of returning to an original language. Um, the image of the Tower of Babel is symptomatic of the birth trauma of nation and national language. Europe is first born as a mosaic of linguistic orphanages, of languages bereft of the medium that had united their speakers in a super-regional whole. Umberto Eco observes, before this confusion, there was no European culture, and hence no Europe. What is Europe anyway? It is a continent, barely distinguishable from Asia, existing before people had invented a name for it. Europe was an entity that had to wait for the fall of the Roman Empire and the birth of the, of the Romano-Germanic kingdoms before it could be born. I love that term, Romano-Germanic kingdoms. Students could form a campus organization, the Romano-Germanic kingdom. How are we going to establish the date when the history of Europe began, begins? The dates of great political events and battles will not do. The dates of linguistic events must serve in their stead. Europe first appears as a babel of new languages. Only afterwards was it a mosaic of nations. Europe was thus born from its vulgar tongues. Vernacular, lang vernacular language is at the heart of nation forming and thus, thus at the heart of nationalism and the ethnic ownership of language. It was nationalist ideologies that uh, generated the first instances of the combination of mother and language or tongue as follows. Icelandic modermal, 1350, Swedish modermale, 1370, English modertung, 1380, Low German modersprache, 1424, High German muttersprache, used by who? Can you guess? 1522, who used it? Meine Germanisten, yeah. Right. Luther. Luther was the first person to use it. Uh -huh. when, in a document where he said that um, communion works better in German than in Latin. Uh, it comes, you can give communion better in German <laughs> because it's closer to the Greek. So. Uh, and the French langue maternelle, 1538. The word nation in the modern sense appears at the same time. Uh, the location of language and body and kinship does not, however, fully account for its naturalization nor for its nationalization. Another ideology played a crucial role in the emergence of language as an implement of ethnic prejudice, the understanding of language by reference to local organic nature. This also begins in Italy in the work of the Renaissance rhetorician Sperone Speroni, a wonderful name. Sounds like ice cream, doesn't it? Yeah 
who was a principal member of the Accademia degli Infiammati and the author in, in 1542 of a polemic advocating publication in the Italian vernaculars. Speroni speaks of our mother tongue, la lingua nostra materna, which is today our own and belongs to no one. It was created by our ancestors who imitated our mother nature, la madre nostra natura. Thereupon follow numerous organic metaphors. Italian is still a short little branch that has yet to fully bloom and produce the fruits that it is capable of bearing. Because Latin was dominant, Italians did not sufficiently cultivate it, but as with a wild plant, left it to age and almost die in the same desert in which it had been born without ever watering it, nor pruning it, nor protecting it from the brambles that overshadowed it. So here we have the entry into the discourse of language of organic metaphors from folkloric origin. Speroni's, or Speroni's organicism of language found significant reception in the work of his French contemporary, Joachim Dubelet. Dubelet was a member of La Pléiade, uh, the literary society that sought to ameliorate the French language. Dubelet's manifesto, Defense et Illustration de la Langue Françoise, uh, con constitutes the first instance of organic metaphors in the validation of French, such as images of, of herbs, roots, and trees. Metaphors that he lifted, however, wholesale from Speroni. He observes that Latin bore fruit, but French has yet to flower or fructify because it was a wild plant that was not watered, pruned, or protected from brambles and thorns. The first advocates of writing in the vernacular found themselves in a kind of linguistic orphanage. Latin and Greek had uncontestable literary and philosophical traditions. The new runaway vernaculars must, by definition, have none. The answer to this dilemma lay in the invention of attributes that were outside of the intellectual tradition received from antiquity. And these attributes had to be local, for one had to differentiate one's own nation and national language from others, as well as from the, tra the tradition of antiquity. National language and character thus became co-determined by the invention of their origin in the mother's body and in local organic nature, in our bodies and our land. This is the beginning of the bi biologizing of language. Very dangerous, very dangerous movement. Uh, the work of the French political theorist Jean Baudin, do we have him up there? Yeah, good. Okay. In his Les Six Livres de la République, views national characteristics as a product of climate and geography. Baudin derives, divides countries into three groups, those within 30 degrees of the equator, the burning regions, those uh, <laughs> between 30 and 60 degrees, the intermediate peoples and temperate regions, and those above 60 degrees, the excessively cold regions. The peoples of the middle regions have the characteristics most conducive to governing. The peoples of the north are strong, but not all that bright. Those of the south are intelligent, but lack physical force. The former have produced good armies, the latter good philosophy. Those of the middle regions, however, combine the best of both worlds. They excelled in government, have established the greatest empires. Example, Greeks and the Romans. Guess who Baudin places right in the middle, of course, the French. And he chooses to emphasize the image of the French as natural mediators in the middle, right? Okay. One sees in Baudin the construction of a certain kind of nature, a psychogeography in the service of nationalist interests. Baudin's um, theories suppose a national character, naturalize it in local physical nature, and thus render it the organic personal property of the French people. Germans did the same thing. Uh, these ide oh, okay. The year 1492, and uh, this is Mary Louise also mentioned this, uh, witnessed the appearance of the first vernacular grammar in any language, the Grammatica della Lengua Castellana of Antonio de Nebria. Nebria de dedicates his grammar to Queen Isabella and characterizes it as a compañero del imperio. Excuse my Italian accent in Spanish. 
He claims, he claims that language has always been a companion of empire, as Latin was for Rome, and says that empires, like languages, grow, flourish, bloom, and wilt. Now is the time for the Spanish Empire and the Castilian language, and his grammar will secure imperial power for Isabella. Thus, the very first vernacular grammar configures language as organic and imperial at the same time. These ideologies subsequently spread to Northern Europe. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, vernacular speakers began to claim their vernacular is the best of all living languages, if not the perfect language. In 1569, Jan van Gorp asserted that the Dutch language in Antwerp was the only one that displayed a perfect representational relationship between words and things. According to Gorp, Antwerp had, be had been colonized by the descendants of the sons of Japheth, the son of Noah, who were not present at the Tower of Babel. Thus, Dutch was not confused by the dispersion of tongues. The Swedish physician and alchemist, Antars Kempe, conjectured that Swedish was the oldest language in the world. In 1638, he wrote Die Sprachen des Paradieses, in which God speaks Swedish, Adam and Eve speak Danish, an imperfect copy, and guess what the serpent speaks? French, eh? the French are going to seduce us, right? Yes, yes. In the 17th century, oh good, that's fine. In the 17th century, the nationalist organicizing of language generated an ideology of a primordial connection between national language and nature itself. In 1641, the German Baroque poet Georg Philipp Hausdorfer claimed that the German language speaks in the languages of nature quite perceptibly expressing all its sounds. I need some water before this. This was hell to translate. OK, what does German do? <clears throat> it rears like the lion, lows like the oxen, snarls like the bear, bells like the stag, bleats like the sheep, grunts like the pig, barks like the dog, whinnies like the horse. Who could rap this? <laughs> Hisses like the snake, meow, uh, meows like the cat, et cetera, et cetera. OK, we get it. Nature speaks, in our, nature speaks in our own German tongue. Adam would not have been able to name the birds and all the other beasts of the fields in anything but our words. Now, the major influential nutcase here is Justus Georg Schotelius, okay? Discussing the Tower of Babel, he asks, what name was it then which the scattered humans wanted to indicate the true God? It is the name from which we Germans have our name, Teut which is thus the name of the true God himself, itself, so that German, Teutisch, more or less means godly or godlike. It is difficult to imagine an assertion more chauvinistic than the name of one's language is the original word for God. I think that about does it. Chotelius then invokes images of, the, of a tree of language, the Sprachbaum. This is where our trees of language come from, guys folkloric and racial origins. We got to stop using them. Excuse me. OK. Chartelius uh, then evokes the image of the tree of language in a confused and quite Baroque morass of entangled analogies. Language possesses, um, oh, I don't, yeah, OK, it's not there. Good, OK. Language possesses word stems that, like juice-rich roots, hydrate the whole language tree whose sprouts and twigs abounding in branches and veins spread high and wide in the most beautiful purity, steady certainty, unimaginable variety. The artful growth of our main language is com comparable to an impressive fertile tree that has extended its juice-rich roots deep, far, and wide into the earth. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. We get the uh, message. <clears throat> One sees here the extremes to which the anxiety of vernacular authority can motivate the philology of nationalism. One, it arrives at a co-determining intertwining of the trees of nature and the trees of language. This is the birth of the ar arboreal models of language that we are familiar with. How does this play out subsequently? The discourse becomes more abstract, but never leaves its folkloric ethnocentric origins. Schotelius was read extensively by Leibniz, this is where Leibniz got it from, who developed the philosophy of organicism. Leibniz, Leibniz influenced Rousseau in his Essai sur l'origine des langues, applies Baudin's theories of climatology to language. 
Rousseau, of course, influenced Herder, relates language and nation to climate. In the 19th century, the philologists Friedrich Schlegel, Wilhelm von Humboldt, and Franz Bopp develop the distinction between analytic and synthetic languages and view the synthetic ones, the European ones, as organic and superior. Okay? The other ones, the analytic ones, are static. They introduce diagrams for, for language, tree diagrams for language, which, acts, which act to configure it genealogically. Uh, Auge Schleicher applied biology to the study of language and saw languages as species and dialects as races. And Schleicher, if I could have the next image, please. Uh, Schleicher was one of the first to have a tree. This, is, this starts looking like what we're familiar with, right, into European tree diagrams. Uh, the Swiss scholar Adolf Pictet from Geneva created the field of linguistic paleontology in which he views the words of a language the way a paleontologist views fossils as incomplete records of older forms that one can use to reconstruct common ancestors. He concentrates on lexical terms in an attempt to ascertain the original natural environment of the Aryan race, our language, our soil. Can I have the next image, please? Now, what Pictet does, he goes through Indo-European roots and locates the, the, um, the organic things that they correspond to in the Indo-European homeland. And he has lists of them. This is the, from the index, lists and lists. Could I have the next image, please? And we can see what he puts up there, right? The, uh, whoops, it's on the other side, excuse me. I, I can't read it from here, but we can see that there, he, he dev devotes a page to, or even more, to each little herb and animal. Now, what's he doing here? Eh? He is locating our Ursprache, our Adamic language, in nature and again in our bodies, he back and forth. The reader is going to read this. He's going to go, he or she is going to go back and forth between language, body, and organic nature. Knit one, pearl two, knit one, pearl two, until, it, until they become unified. Um, the French religious historian Ernest Renan used philology to formulate a theory of the superiority of the Aryans over Jews based on a matrix of language, ethnicity, and environment. For Renan, the ancient Jews were nonetheless rooted in a desert civilization that was not only primitive and crude, but incapable of evolution. Ernst Haeckel, the famous 19th century biologist, published The History of Creation in 1868. Could I have, uh, we need to advance now. There's more stuff from, please, please keep on going because uh, there's more stuff there from, uh, yeah, that's what we need right there. I did it in English because it comes across better in English. The German is die natürliche Schöpfungsgeschichte, but I like, you know, I'm writing the history of creation. I like the resonances better. Um, the work begins with single-celled organisms, produce, pr proceeds to the vegetable and animal kingdoms, then to mammals, finally culminating with the study of humans. One chapter is entitled Migration and Distribution of Mankind, Human Species and Human Races, and contains only one large diagram. It is entitled Pedigree of the indo germani and is situated on two opposing pages. The left side depicts the Semites, in the same way that the language tree diagrams are, to be, are depicted. On the, uh, the right side is, could I have the next image, please? The Indo-Germani. Yeah. The organization of this diagram is quite revealing. The opposing pages visually separate the two human families and affect an othering of the Semitic race. This is an example of language as race and racism. Okay, to conclude, in the early modern period, the notion of language as a botanical entity entered into the cultural habitus. The habitual understanding of language as such aided in its enracination and configuration within the matrix of race and ethnicity. The nursery that gave rise to the arboretum of language progressively generated intellectual sublimations of the arboreal model into organicist theories of language that intermingled with the images of maternality and lactation. The botanical configuration of language became more and more abstract, but the generalizing gestures always recovered and reinforced 
language-specific ethnic ideologies. We Aryans have a natural, primeval, organic language. They have something else. The genealogical model of language families was used to sketch broad eco-linguistic distinctions between Semitic and Aryan and to separate Christians from Jews. This generated Ernest Renan's curious statement that organic languages cannot grow in the desert. Can I have the next image, please? Has this ended? Near 2000, uh, we have the Italian uh, biologist, the famous Italian uh, uh, biologist whose name escapes me, I'm having a mental block here, uh, Cavalli Sforza, whom I had to communicate with to get uh, this model. And what's he doing here? Oh, sure, uh, you know, we can't make genetic arguments for language, but let's try anyway. Meanwhile, we can't, but let's try anyway, and we can see what he's doing here. He's trying to coordinate genetic distributions of populations with linguistic families, and even gets into this odd nostratic thing. Uh, I don't want to offend anybody into nostratics. I, I tell my students, I think these guys did too much weed in college, is what I tell them. Okay. Nationalism itself was born in the early modern period of and in language and articulated in the, in the apparently innocent kinship metaphors of maternality and nativity, as well as in the ideology of a natural connection between national character and national geography. Organic metaphors were thus taken from body and nature to construct the myths of imagined congenital communities that still persist today. The nationalist adhesives that fuse self and nation are fabricated from myriad ideologies of ownership and exclusive possession. The notion of the linguistic birthright of the native speaker communicated in, mater in maternal and organic metaphors of nativity is but one of the contributory ideologies. It is, however, in its prejudicial aspects, among the least perceptible and most embedded forms of nationalism. It is dissolved into the discourse of, quotidi of quotidian life and letters to the point where it is taken for granted as self-evident and neutrally descriptive. Invoked reflexively, its performance remains transparent. Thank you very much. <laughs>